Uh, welcome to the Sports Science Dudes. I am your host, Dr. Jose Antonio, with my co-host, Dr. Tony Ricci. Um, our guest today is Julius Dwayne Thomas, like the middle name there. Um, he's, wor <laughs> he's working towards his PsyD or doctorate in clinical psychology at, the, at Nova Southeastern University, which we, the three of us are at. Um, he earned his BS degree from Portland State University. He's also an advisory board member for the Society for Neurosports, a player advisory board member for the Football Players Health Study at Harvard, and we need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, he's a co-founder and chief health and performance innovation officer at Nestry Health and Performance. Um, as a professional athlete, Mr. Thomas observed the opportunity to help others create a greater quality of life. He's passionate about helping others and utilizing his experiences to see positive change in individuals' lives. But prior to being an academic nerd, which is what he is now, uh, Mr. Thomas played in the NFL. He played a position of tight end uh, for the Broncos from 2011 to 14, the Jags 15 to 16, and then finally the Miami Dolphins uh, in 2017. Um, he earned Pro Bowl honors in 2013 and 2014. However, and most importantly, do not forget this, Mr. Julius Thomas and I are co-instructors in the most awesome class at Nova Southeastern <laughs> University. Yeah. Sports neuroscience. So we are killing our students um, and we have a lot of fun with it. So let's welcome uh, Mr. Julius Thomas to the show. Man, thank you guys for having me. I mean, honestly, you guys are two of my favorite people, two people that have given me so much information about really just academia, research, two people I look up to in your perspective fields and two people I enjoy working with as often as I can. So I'm excited to be on you guys' show. You know, I feel like a sports science dude myself. So uh, <laughs> You are, JT. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to getting nerdy with you guys and, um, you know, giving a lot of education because, you know, that's that's what we all have in common. You know, we love being educators and uh, getting down into the research, but then making sense of it because who just wants to look at research on its own? You got to make it a little right. bit more fun. Amen. Right. Amen. Yep. Now, I know we have, uh, we have a whole slew of questions for you because you have a really unique background. However, I want to touch on something that I think only you and really professional athletes and maybe individuals in the military have to deal with. And as you know, today, or maybe you've heard, uh, Tom Brady retired after like mm -hmm. two plus decades. Wow. Now, the question is this, because you went through this, Julius, when you've been doing the same thing for 20, 30 or 20 to 30 years, there's got to be a, an interesting like mental and emotional adjustment that players and or soldiers are not used to. So could you sort of explain what, what's going on in the mind of a professional athlete? All of a sudden, wait, you wake up and wait, I don't have to go to practice. No one's telling me what to do. There's got to be a really, the adjustment's got to be really difficult. Yeah, you know, it's, it's such a challenging adjustment. And I always refer to it as the transition. And let's just be honest, transitions in life are hard. Transitions are tough when you go from middle school to high school and worried about what it's going to be, or you go from high school to college. But um, I think transitioning out of the military or transitioning professional sports into whatever you're going to do next are some of the most difficult challenges and the most difficult transitions a person can experience. And I think the data supports it, right? Like if you look at at-risk populations after transition, you're looking at pro athletes and you're looking at um, ex-military. Wow. So that's probably one of the, the things that sticks out to me the most, something I'm obviously have applied um, myself to wanting to help in and going through this transition um, on my own. But, you know, I think when you leave the game, I try to talk and teach people from a neuroscience perspective, and, and we can talk about that a little bit here is right, yeah. is the neurons in your brain have been trained to experience reward, right? So every time I catch a pass, and the crowd goes crazy, that's rewarding. Every time I get up and I have a great workout, every time I do something in and around the game that I played, it feels rewarding to me. And those are often the most rewarding experiences you have in your day-to-day -day life. But then overnight, all of a sudden, your brain no longer has access to any of those rewards. So what a lot of people experience is this low, this, this state of depression, maybe not clinical depression, but loss of access to the things that were meaningful, joyful, and exciting to you all at once in a dramatic fashion. And then that creates an emotional challenge that it can be hard for people to overcome. I mean, 
how many former athletes or military personnel like abuse substances or um, have troubles with their marriage and, and all these things that happen. And I think that there's an underlying emotional struggle that's often um, under discussed. Yeah, so essentially, too, JT, that that articulates it wonderfully too. What's going on, and you you're falling off a cliff to an extent. I mean, there, there's right. no transition here. Like your identity is, hey, I'm J. I mean, not just you, but we'll use you as an example. I'm Julius Thomas, tight end, right? Don Good one, two time Pro Bowl. Um, unfortunately, the bad things you do were in front of eighty thousand people or ten million on TV, but the good things you did were on in front of eighty thousand people. Yep. And, um, you know, 10 million people on TV. I can't I can't imagine the, the extent of the the high, the the what it takes the human body to get up for what it receives. And like you said, that comes to a dead stop. It's phenomenal when you think about it. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's the harsh reality of it. Right. And then you've got this other component on top of it. Of the transition is you've lost your mastery overnight. You mm, developed the skill set right. that you became one of the top, 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 top percentage in the world at doing it and then overnight it has no value right so say if you're a lawyer you become one of the best lawyers in the world you do that until you hit the grave right. you're one of the best physicians researchers etc you carry your mastery with you until these later parts of your life but i always tell people all the time they used to pay me 10 million dollars to catch footballs now i can make zero dollars from catching so everything i built what i invested myself in it now becomes not only essentially worthless, but my mastery is gone. And now I have to develop new mastery. And that's one of the biggest challenges I see that athletes are facing when I'm working with them and their transitions out of the league is, man, what's going to give me that feeling back? I, I, where do I get my juice from? And I tell them, you got to build it back. The same way you built those neurons to appreciate that and to seek that, you got to do that for new ones. Now explain though, because obviously your you know the idea of going through a transition is what you're doing now. However, in in academics, um, anyone studying for a doctorate, the the rewards are actually quite minimal for a lot for most part. And, and oftentimes it depends who your advisor is, who you work with. I've I've talked to PhDs who said it was the worst experience of their life. Their advisor beat the crap out of them every day, and the reward was basically, oh, finally I graduated. Now what am I doing? So, uh, so that's so much different than you know what Tony described in terms of you're getting applauses and cheers and whatnot. What applause or what cheers do you get now? Or is it something? Is it something internal? You're like, wow, I you know I, I co-authored a paper or you know I gave a talk. It's not the same thing, but there was there must be a different appreciation for it. Yeah, no, I think that. Um... When I reflect upon it, I think, you know, what's rewarding in the experience, um, that becomes a challenge. And you have to be able to identify what are these new things that I can give myself, you know, a win about, or I can give myself some credit for that helps me feel good. And it's oftentimes, it's hard to do in a PhD program because you're just getting hit over the head with more and more assignments. You never feel like you become the master of anything because the courses are changing every semester because now you get a new supervisor that's telling you that, what you do is shitty and they can't believe you're turning this work in. If you ever want to be great in the field, you got to get so much better. But for me, you know, I really try to hone in on how much am I growing and what is changing about my experience. And I think that's really been great to do research, you know, and you've got advisors and the way they look at it. But when you're doing research, you often get a chance to have those experiences that become really rewarding, right? Like when we collect data, and then I get to sit around with you guys at a table and talk about what the data means. And then when you're uh, in the beginning, all you hear is wah, 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 uh, bone density, wah, 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 uh, statistically significant. And then over time, you start to go, wow, this is like watching a chalk talk in the NFL and being able to sit down and break down schemes and plays because now I'm getting it. And you go to conferences and you're sitting there going, oh, this is making sense. It's, I'm starting to understand these concepts. And as that happens, that becomes rewarding. But let's be honest, you know, getting a doctor is one of the hardest grinds you can ever go through. I've been through NFL training camps and uh, getting a doctoral degree is equally as difficult wow. in, in many ways. No, that's a good description. It is a grind and I've described it. It's an endurance test and just, mm -hmm. you can't quit. You just got to yep. keep going. Um, so let me ask you this. We, uh, you know, 
both Tony and I, we teach in the exercise science department. So I want to ask you this question and think of it as you're talking to an exercise science crowd. Yep. Um, playing professional football, or even you played college basketball, the, the commitment uh, in terms of training and time and um, knowing your personality, having someone tell you what to do every day, whether you think they're correct or not, you have to do it. What is that like for someone like you who obviously you're fine leaving all of that, but during a period of time, you were basically told what to do all the time. Um, what, was that, what was that like for you? Uh, that was, uh, it was always challenging for me, honestly. Uh, I was the guy that avoided the strength coach at all times on campus. <laughs> I'm talking about like, I never walked past the hallway because I didn't want the guy. I mean, strength coaches, they live in the weight room. They love it, right? Anytime you walk by, hey, man, you want to get an extra lift in? Hey, you want to get some extra curls? Like, no, <laughs> I actually don't. And I'm actually upset that I have to be here at 6 a.m. tomorrow and do all these exercises and do all this lifting that you want me to do. So it was a challenge for me. Um, I was the kind of guy that would avoid the weight room as much as possible because there was nothing volitional about that training. And mm -hmm. the other thing I think that I wish I would have known then is I wish they would have educated me. It's one thing for a guy to come in and say, Julius, you know, you got to lift 275 pounds six times for four sets, or, you know, we really need you to go run a mile under this time, or we're going to have you do this many box jumps and this many step up overhead weighted uh, step ups. And you're like, for what? Boy, I was born athletic. Like, leave me alone. Like, I'm going to jump high tomorrow, whether I come in here today or not. And they're harping on you about nutrition. But when you don't educate, it just seems like, you know, here's this guy that was put in power. It's just yelling at you and forcing you to do things that make you sore and make practicing more challenging because now you got to practice with the soreness from the weight training. Um, but now when you started to teach me about, you know, exercise science and when I get to listen to Dr. Richie come in and talk about energy systems, I go, holy shit, I should have had a different, I needed this information when I was training. It would have made it make more sense and I would have had a different approach to it. I think to some extent too, Julius, it's incumbent upon coaches too, though, to really try to correlate what you, because to your point, look what you said, you, you put up, it's a bunch of numbers, right? Those not, you're getting numbers, but what do the numbers mean to your first step on the field? What do the numbers mean to the ability to catch a certain type of pass? What do the numbers potentially mean to maybe a longer contract, a longer career, if you want? I think sometimes there's a lack of relating in particular in anything in life, right? If you're a coach, it's intent and purpose. So yeah, we want to lift some weights. You're going to get stronger, but that's to your point, that's not enough. You can already do that. However, what's the relationship between lifting weights and everything specifically the day you step on the field? Maybe if that's built, uh, you know, in, much more effectively, there's more motivation behind it. I, I just see that in a global context too. You know, it, like when I train with the fighters, hey, we're not doing a hex bar dead. Anybody can do a hex bar dead. This is a right hand. This is a shot. This is this is the preventing a takedown. So I, I I could be wrong, but I guess building that relationship to it would would have helped. You know. No, and you correlate um, the the strength training programs to performance. You add in the understanding that athletes don't have, right? I, I'm still learning exercise science, but what's crazy is I was training for 15 years at the highest levels. And then now I can sit and look at some of Jose's lectures and go, ah, oh, I had no clue. I've done more hang cleans, power cleans than <laughs> most people on earth, never understanding right. about muscle tissue, never right. understanding about power and, um, creating force and all these things that were essential to what I was doing for my life and my career. But it was just be there at 6 a.m. or be there at 3.30 p.m. and go get your ass busted for an hour and a half and now just go be really sore than you and your buddies sit around on the couch playing video games talking about how strength coach is the worst guy ever. <laughs> you need to get off your back because you got a game in two days. Oh, my God. Well, if there is such a thing as a, um, a typical day of training, explain to the undergrad exercise science student how difficult that is, because when you're dealing with a team sport as complicated as football, it's, it's much different than, you know, people, people can understand marathon run training. They're like, oh, well, that's just a lot of freaking running. 
but in football, I mean, obviously for your position, it's, it's different than someone who plays the O line or D line or whatnot. So explain, explain the physical grind involved in that. Yeah. You know, uh, as you, I think the physical grind changes as your career increases, you know, so I'll start off at college because I think that's the first time where you start taking a, a trained person. Some people go to really nice high schools. I didn't, no one did it. Coach did it. And he took you to the weight room, but in high school, it becomes more uh, systematic. I mean, college, excuse me. So, you know, you know, you have to do your weights that day and or conditioning, right. And it's always going to be the worst for the players that they know they got weights and conditioning right. that day. So, you know, you start off a typical season and you've got weights, you've got conditioning in the morning and you're going to go through that. And this person is trying to increase your fitness capacity. And then you go from weights conditioning that maybe takes an hour and a half to two hours. Then you got to go run to get something to eat. Then you're running the class. So you're showing up to class. You're, you're sweating underneath the, the, the college sweatsuit you have on trying to focus on class. But you know, like, wait, I got practice an hour after this next class. And then you're running back to the gym. Now you're getting back into your practice clothes. Now you're busting for three hours of hard practice. Then you go home, you're sore, you're beat up, and then you're going to do it again, and you're going to do it again, and you're going to do it again, and that becomes challenging. But when you're a pro, it becomes even more complex because then you got to get there early, 7.30. Then you got to do treatment. So in the pros, you add the recovery component. I think the biggest thing I didn't do in college that wasn't really stressed, but it's hard because you've got this class schedule that's pretty crazy, is the recovery. So in the pros, you got recovery. Then you're going to go do your morning meetings. Then you go lift, train, run out on the field, you name it. You go back to meetings. Then you go to practice. Then you leave practice. Then you do recovery before you go home. Grab some nutritional stuff, shake, whatever you have to do. Then you go home. Then you got to recover again that night. So when you start talking about how much time you're spending just on your physical fitness, it becomes pretty demanding, really, to keep up with that schedule. That's I don't insane. think that's obviously most people aren't cognizant of what you guys did and what you do. And, you know, it's just, Oh, everybody thinks you're just going out and playing football, but the demands are incredible and the end result. And um, I guess before just to, I think giving context and athletic performance and pro sport is, is really important. I think we all don't grasp it at times, but to talk about physical machines I think I learned about American football and it's so Julius, you're what, six six? Six five, yep. Yeah, six five. And you played at what, two seventy, you said, or no, uh, I played at probably two fifty five. At two fifty five. All right. So when you stand next to Julius, he's about as wide as the Hoover Dam. Okay. <laughs> Trained hard, two time Pro Bowl, great tight end. And then he's telling you <laughs> that there are guys on that field that threw you around yeah. like you were an empty water bottle. Yep. <laughs> and, and I don't think it's until that time where you realize, wow, that is what's going on. If somebody's throwing this guy around, like like in the capacity that you told me, you was you you really grasp this. This is something different, man. These are the elite of the elite, and the physicality that goes on in that field, I think, is uncomprehendable to most human beings. No, man, it's it's a shocker. It's truly yeah. a shocker. I always tell people, you want to know what pro sports are like is like you, you ever went to like a pop warner little league game and you watched a, a kid out there and you go who is that kid he's standing out or she's standing out amongst these 12 year olds or 11 year olds this is ridiculous when it gets to high school the competition is going to a little bit closer and this playing field is going to even out but then somehow some way some <laughs> high school kid you're going this is not fair this kid <laughs> When they get to college, this playing field is going to even out and it's going to get closer. Lo and behold, somehow you get to college and there's some freak right. out there doing some things <laughs> that you go, it's not possible what they're doing. Exactly. You get to the pros, it's going to even out. And then yet again, there's again. another person that's a freak that's just head and shoulders above everybody, even now that you've selected for the best athletes in the world. I tell people an example about Von Miller. Here's a guy. 6'3, 250 pounds, that runs a 4'5, four, 4'6, four, 40, but he's bend. His ability to bend on the edge. Here's a guy that can squat 
and have his knee dragging the grass right. and come oh. out of a, of a deep one-legged squat position at full speed, explode around the corner at, at forces. I mean, I, I would love to know what those forces are and be on the quarterback's back in a second and not in 1.9 seconds. Those sacks are happening in 1.9 seconds. Nine. It's That's crazy. One, two. And there's hand contact within that 1.9. He's wow. grabbing a 315 pound man, rocking him back, snatching that guy around like he's a stuffed animal. The guy's <laughs> laying on the ground and here's a quarterback going, man, I thought I had a guy open and now I'm on the ground trying to wipe grass and mud out of my eye. It's incredible, man. <laughs> That's football, man. It is tough. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, that, those are some funny stories. Um, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about something that's uh, more of a serious issue within professional football, but even might even say the fight sports because of head contact, even mm -hmm. soccer. Um, yep. We did that study where we looked at uh, female soccer players who had higher levels of, of NFL neuro, neurofilament light as a marker for brain injury. Now, you work with the um, the football players health study at Harvard. And from the start of your career up until now, what, what have you learned in terms of how, I guess, how the NFL or even sports in general, how they should deal with head trauma? Because it's clearly an issue, particularly in professional football. Um, and I know, and Tony and I had this discussion about, you know, football versus rugby. Why it would happen more in football than rugby? And we say, well, because rugby, you don't wear a helmet in rugby. So you have to learn actually how to tackle without using your head. But that's sort of a sidebar. But uh, explain a little bit about, you know, this in terms of uh, head trauma in uh, professional football. Yeah, you know, head trauma is one of those things that I'm happy that we've highlighted it and that we've got to a point where we recognize it as a risk. Because when I was playing, it was not recognized as a risk. And that wasn't that long ago. We weren't talking about this in 2011. Um, people were thinking, you know, there's some crazy doctor over there saying they found something, but no one's paying attention to that here. I mean, Dr. Tartar would always ask me, Julius, were you worried about your brain when you were playing? No, why would I be? I was worried about my knee, my neck, my back, like my shoulders, like, cause I'm watching guys tear pecs and bicep tendons off their body, trying to just put their arm out and stop a guy running. So it's really been, I think, really beneficial for sports that we've now started to highlight really some of the long-term negative effects that could happen from uh, repeated head exposures. Uh, one of the biggest problems are the games were built without this information. What do we do now with these games now that this data is coming out? And what are we doing to create strategies to be neuroprotective? Is it supplementation? Is it stuff like we're doing at Nestry with consistent biofeedback for the brain or neurofeedback for the brain? Is it more days off between contact? One of the things that I never understood was why not create days um, off between pads, right? So why wear pads for three days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday off, Sunday? Why not gap them just one day in between? Just give the body one extra day one sleep cycle to help remove some of those, uh, some of the damage that's happening and some of the inflammatory uh, variables that are happening to give you that extra day of flush. Um, I think it's an issue. We understand that it's real. We're starting to get better context around who it affects, how often, you know, we got to this point where we thought every single person was going to get cognitive decline. I think that we're past that. We now know it's not going to happen to everybody. But there are certain risk factors that we talk about with the football players health study at Harvard that are showing that these, these positions are these length of careers are more at risk for developing cognitive decline. Which, posi which positions would those be? I'm going to give you a guess. You got a guess. Well, I would. Mm. Uh, I mean, I got to. I mean, you, I don't know. We going online here. I mean, they got contact every, every play, right? Yeah. So, you know, you're talking about linebackers and running backs and we know we understand that, right? These guys are the ones that run through the hole. Hole opens up oh, that and makes into each other from 10 yards apart. Good point. These are, these guys have bad intentions every time they're on the field. So you've got running backs and linebackers. You've got your interior linemen and your defensive linemen, because you're talking about people are not 
People don't understand the forces that are happening. When Aaron Donald lines up six inches from your hat, which is what we refer to as a helmet, that dude's legs, they're built like springs that could send probably a car off the ground. And when the ball snaps and he, boom, that force, he's bringing right into you and whatever's in the way. And you do that 60 times, 70 times a game, but you're also doing it in practice, right? So think about how many exposures you're getting throughout a week over a career. And so we tend to see it in those positions, but then also there's this inverted U that we've started to notice in the data. It's really incredible is the people that played the shortest time tend to be the healthiest, but then the people that played the longest tend to be the healthiest. It's these people that played between eight and 10 years that seem to have the most negative health outcomes. Wow. Is that, would that be because, well, obviously the shorter ones, the ones who played the least, it makes sense they would have the least. The guys who last long, they're just playing smarter. They, they know what not to do. Is that, is that why? So it's actually pretty funny. And uh, I was sitting down and with, in the study, they started to pull me in on some of the research. They were going, wow, you're doing research. You know, maybe you have some insights for some things that maybe we haven't seen. So one of the ways that they determine risk is uh, years of play. And that's like the standard way to determine risk. And I'm like, nah, that to a player doesn't make much sense because, you know, the guys that play the longest are what? Punters, kickers, long snappers, and backup quarterbacks. So now you're there messing your data all up. So you're going, well, something about these guys, right? Is, is it biology? Is it the way they play that's allowing the guys that play the longest to be the healthiest? And I'm like, no. But if you play 18, 19 years, you probably weren't getting hit as much. So you look at the amount of snaps that a person plays throughout their career. And the guys eight to 10 years were playing the most snaps. These are the guys that are running down on kickoff every for an entire season for 10 seasons, right? Like there's a lot of exposure there. These are the guys that are mixing it up in the trenches. So it's actually the amount of snaps a person has and playing position um, or that eight to 10 year that start to have the most negative health outcomes. Hmm. Yeah, that would make complete sense. And you forget about that because that data would be, as you've noted, completely skewed by one Tom Brady, 13, uh, you know, punters and uh, uh, Ryan, Ryan, well, Ryan Fitzpatrick took a lot of snaps, but to your point about backup QBs, they can be around 14, 15, 16 years, right? Well, look, at, um, uh, look at the backup quarterback for Kansas City. Um, we played together in Jacksonville. Right. And he backed up Blake Bortles in Jacksonville, and now he backs up Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City. So how many snaps does he get in a year? Right. But he's playing in year 13, 14. So you've got, I call it dinosaur data, because if you can <laughs> make it past 12, 13 years of football, you're a dinosaur. So they're sitting there, they're going, man, these guys are so healthy to play the long time. <laughs> Their surgeries are down. The, the chronic disease they have later is down. What's going on here? And I'm like, no, those guys weren't taking the same beatings. So I, I do have one question, Julius, regarding with the awareness um amongst the players now obviously and and like to your point the guys that know they're taking a lot of snaps you know uh, are they do you see i'm sure someone like you is going to have a large influence on this in the future do you see better uh behaviors out you know the the external behaviors that are required for health too like even mental health are they are they working harder to get to sleep or potentially take the the supplements that might be helpful like are, are players much more cognizant of some of the behaviors that we know that might mitigate the effects of this. Is that starting to take hold, do you think? Um, in my experience, no, no? because okay. where does the education happen, right? Just like I said, I wasn't educated. I was just told what to do. So I never understood the why. I never understood the risks. And then, you know, how many former athletes or current athletes are really biologists like you have to start to understand the biology i mean jose you tell me that all the time like once you understand the mechanisms at play then you can go you have all these aha moments but it's hard to find professional athletes that are going to sit down and learn about physiology so you've got that fact but then also the the football players health study recently published a paper that was actually pretty phenomenal for me to read and they showed that it appears that former professional football players have lost their middle age. 
They just go from young, healthy studs to old. And they showed that uh, former football players tend to experience the same rates of chronic disease and illness as the average typical American male 10 years older than them. So you're seeing heart disease, diabetes, um, arthroplastic, uh, arthroplasty and, and different types of knee and hip surgeries, um, cognitive deficit. Like you're seeing this 10 years before the rest of the population in these players. And that's some of the stuff that the study is doing. It's been really incredible to get that message out. I was talking to one of the researchers today and I said, if there's one single thing that I want to make clear is I need current football players to know <clears throat> that they're the most at risk demographic in our country, not only because they played the game of football, but because of a lot of the health and disease risks that African-American males face in general. Right. I mean, that demographic has a ton of chronic disease and illness, but it's not discussed enough. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's crazy that uh, former pro professional athletes would be at that high a risk because as you know, the average American, I mean, the United yeah. States is moving towards you know, three out, of, three out of every four individuals will be overweight or obese. So, and those are just non-athletes. These are just your average person. Now, compound that with, you know, you quit playing professional sports and you're, you know, some guys gain weight. Some guys actually are pretty good at maintaining a normal weight. Yep. Um, but yeah, any kind of weight gain, you know, type two diabetes, uh, insulin resistance. And, and you and I have talked a lot about, you know, issues related to excessive weight gain. And it's just, it's just not a good thing, but it's, it's hard. I guess it's hard for someone who has dealt with that kind of physical grind to suddenly figure out, okay, should I just go to the gym three times a week and do some cardio and lifting? Cause that's gotta be sort of an, a weird thing to look at as a pro athlete. Like, wait a minute, I used to kill myself. And now you want me to go to orange theory and do a circuit. It, it, it's just gotta be odd. Whereas individuals, like I talked to a lot of people who, who compete in individual sports, whether it's the run, bike, swim sports, where they can still do their sport and they know as they get older, they're not going to be as good, but they can still do it. And for them, it's not as hard a transition because runners can always run, cyclists can always cycle and swimmers can always swim. So the team sport stuff has just got to be, the dynamics of it must be really complicated. No, I think that um, some of the other <clears throat> behavioral risk factors that former players face is chronic pain. Right. Like wow. Jose, you and I talk about it all the time. You know, when I was 29 years old, you know, I go see the orthopedic surgeon and he tells me, JT, man, don't spend the rest of your life running. You know, when you see those guys out there pounding the pavement, doing four or five miles a day, you don't have the meniscus in either knee for that. Wow. So not that I liked running or was going to run, but if I wanted to, now that's off the table. Mm -hmm. We have guys that are in their 50s, 60s that I sit with on some of these player advisory calls that have had three or four back surgeries. Now it's one thing to have three or four low back surgeries in your thirties, but just imagine what happens with arthritis, disc health when you're 50. So now they're telling me, you know, my decision in the morning is do I wake up and sit in chronic pain so that I could be lucid and I could go hang out with my grandkids a little bit in the backyard or do I take the morphine so I don't have to feel it? So you've got a lot of injuries. You've got a lot of chronic pain that now become limits to behave to healthy behavioral functioning, but then you've also got a health literacy problem. I mean, we have a, a national and global health literacy problem, but you also see it in professional sports. So they don't know what they should be doing when they're done. Then they also have learned eating patterns, right? Like I'm eating 6,500 to maybe 7,500 calories a day playing football. But when you're done playing football, now you got to get back down to 2,500, 2,700. How do you get through that process? What are the cultural dynamics, right? We're talking about typically African-American guys from inner cities. Is that where they're teaching all the health literacy? Is that where they're teaching the importance of maintaining mobility and flexibility over time? And so there's a lot of risk factors that guys face. And unfortunately, it leads to a lot of negative health outcomes. Now, now we, we know you hate running. You've told me you'll never run again the rest of your life. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's probably, there's a lot of uh, people out there who probably agree with you. Agree with you. They're like, ah, running sucks. Yeah. However, have you replaced, I know you uh, practice jujitsu. Is that something that at least replaces some of the, you know, the physical uh, 
uh, contact or, or not really competition since you're not going to compete in it. But is that at least an adequate replacement? Yeah, for me, I always say it gives me my fix. What do I need to do? I need to compete. I need to get a little bit of sense of that battle. That's just, I just say my nervous system was trained for that. And I don't want to completely lose it, but I'm trying to find a better activity that gives me resistance and endurance training. The amount of endurance that it takes to grapple, it was astounding to me when I first got on that mat and went, geez, this has to be one of the hardest workouts you could ever do. I mean, you can get done with grappling and it could feel like you've done 10,000 curls that day just because you had to try and connect yourself to another person. And in jujitsu, they call it, you know, you got to get sticky and create that close contact. So for me, it's like four, three or four times a week, I get to go spar. If you spar for 30 minutes, three or four times a week, I guarantee you, you got the elevated heart rate you needed. You burn the calories that you should, and you're definitely getting some um, some mobility as well with some of the Absolutely. positions you're in. Um, but if you're getting on the ground, like, and that's one of the most phenomenal things for me about doing jujitsu is, man, I got to get my old ass on the ground and I got to <laughs> move around on that ground. And I always say is I got to do this as long as I can, because it keeps me young. If I can come roll and flip and grapple with guys in their twenties for the next 10 to 15 years, I, I think that that's probably uh, a pretty good workout. And, um, and I'll take it. And I would imagine a good mood elevator um, for a lot of what, you know, some of the guys to your point are, are lacking after the career is over, you know, just coming out of there with a little sense of accomplishment. So. Yeah. And it, well, you got that hurdle, right? It was, it was a big challenge for me to go back to being the worst athlete in the room. Yeah. Uh, that was something I hadn't experienced since I was maybe 12 years old. And here I am trying to learn how to move on my back or how to wrestle. And that's its own learning curve. But once you push through that, and you start to develop that mastery, it becomes a pretty exciting thing. Because, you know, now you start to learn the intricacies of the sport, and then you get camaraderie back, right. And that's another thing that people miss when you're a team sport guy is, man, where, where do I go to, to feel part of a group? But me, man, I go over there, I hang out with a, a bunch of the other 40 crazy people that go fight people uh, three or four times a week. And it gives me that, that um, I would probably be missing a lot otherwise. Well, I know Tony thinks uh, <clears throat> next to boxing, I guess wrestling might be the second hardest or the grappling sports, right, Tony? I do. I do just the only reason why, and I do a lot of it. Um, I do still do just, uh, you know, um, again, getting punched in the head repetitively is just not that good for you. So <laughs> it's, it's where I differentiate the boxing. I know a lot of the jujitsu guys and wrestlers get really upset about that. Um, it's, you know, we're talking about it today, right? Being hit in the head isn't all that good for you. So that's what just differentiates boxing when it's the ultimate goal. Even in the NFL, the, the head contact is there, particularly on the line, but they try to avoid it today, right? They yep. do the best they can. In boxing, it's the ultimate goal. So I do think it differentiates it. Peripherally, yeah, you get a lot of fatigue in jujitsu, but the sheer damage to the old noggin is, is pretty bad in the boxing sport. No, I mean, we got to be honest, right? Punch drunk CTE, really the lineage yeah. of understanding that getting hit in the head is is not good. Like, and I think it's also something that we always have to make clear anytime we talk about it. You know, you get one brain, treat it like yeah. you only get one. You can beat it up in a way that creates a lot of dysfunction for you in life. And um, boxing was the first sport to really get attention for that. Yeah. Uh, but I think that there's less people in boxing on the ancillary parts, Absolutely. right? Yep. It's like, there's, they're not, a, it's not a huge outcry to change boxing exactly. because those are some old school burly dudes in there. And they're like, you know, this is just kind of what we do, but make no mistake about it. Boxing is probably the most dangerous sport for head trauma. I mean, we see stories of people dying on the spot Definitely. and that makes where the risks in boxing unique. Go on. Just a quick question on that. We know then, Julius, and from your work, Harvard, and what we're learning, um, I mean, it, the, the, is there a, a minimum, I guess, threshold or frequency or years? Because the depression is heavily correlated, correct, to yep. long-term concussion. Uh, it, it Very hard to, to uh, mitigate the effects, or it can often even lead to a clinical depression. Is that correct? Yeah, well, there's just so many symptoms, right? They'd all get conflated, right? You look at the uh, DSM criteria for anxiety and okay. depression, right? 
they got similar um, symptoms. You look at depression and anxiety and CTE, and they've really started to try and define symptoms and living people conflated. So it's really hard to be able to determine, you know, how is one impacting the other? And those models, you know, that's another level of nerd. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll get into some time over some of the research, but it's going to be so important for a person to do the basic healthy things if they want to do the most they can to prevent negative effects from whatever sport they played. It comes down to the basics, right? Get some exercise, sleep, try and eat healthy, manage your social relationships, keep your stress low, and don't abuse substances. And if you find yourself feeling off, just please talk to somebody. Yep, yep. Worst thing that can happen is you can sit down in front of a clinician and they can say, you're all good, man. You're normal. You know, it's like, just go get that clarity. You know, there's, there's sometimes, and there's other, there's groups of people saying, should we be telling these contact sports athletes that CTE is their future? What's that doing for their current functioning? Is that going to make them feel hopeless and um, powerless to affect positive change in their health? Maybe it is. So maybe we should tell people and encourage them to do the right things behaviorally that can help them down the road. You know, going towards <clears throat> sort of more of your personal experience now, um, when I was an undergrad, I was a biology major. And I, as an undergrad, I decided that I was going to pursue a PhD in the exercise sciences. My father was a physician. He said, why don't you go into medicine? And I said, because I don't like to work with sick people. I, yeah. In fact, when he brought me to the hospital, I immediately disliked the smell of hospitals. I was like, I cannot do this at all. So, but my interest in exercise science stems from, and I know Tony and I, you know, we talk about this, sort of the love of watching humans do really crazy things, whether it's running 100 meters really fast or running 26.2 miles fast or watching professional sports, whether it's soccer, basketball, or baseball. So that's what prompted me to study exercise science. What prompted you to pursue um, clinical psychology, which I would think as a former athlete, you'd be like, oh, exercise science would seem to be a good fit. But obviously it was more on the psychology side, but not a research, not on the research side of it, but more on the clinical application. So what was your thought process going through? You know, obviously when you retired, you're thinking, this is what will fill my time. This is what will be rewarding to me. And why did you choose that path? No, that's a great question. Uh, when I retired, um, it, I, I laugh about it because people look at me and they go, are you crazy? Because my two decisions yeah. were one, you know, 29 years old, travel the world and, and see the place or come back to school, put the, put the backpack back on <laughs> and go back and do another six years of work. Um, and then I just had this epiphany, you know what, if I go travel the world, there is no way in hell that I'm going back to school. All I've been doing is busting ass my whole life. Like, let me just keep it going. So I remember being um, in undergraduate classes because I wasn't a psychology major in undergrad. I was a business major. So I had to make up enough psychology credits to get into the doctoral program. And here I am and these 19 year olds and 20 year olds are looking at me in class going, dude, we come to college to make money so that we don't have to do this. <laughs> yeah. Why are you here? Uh, but I, I really had uh, these experiences when I played of seeing really behavioral displays that everyone knew wasn't healthy, right? Like we, we've we seen them. We can imagine situations and guys we've seen just whack out. And the ones that make it to the public, we have those more often you would like to think within buildings. And I would always say, man, somebody should help that guy. Somebody should help that guy. Somebody should help that guy. And then one day I was like, man, if you're the one that sees the problem, why don't you do something about it? And then I, at the same kind of time in my life, I was like, I, I actually started to feel better helping other people reach their goal than me reaching my own. And when that kind of hit me, I was like, you know, all roads are leading to going to learn psychology because that's going to teach you about how to help people and how the human mind works. But then, you know, I get kind of pulled in with uh, you and JT, and then I start learning neuroscience. And I'm like, wow, I think this is even cooler than psychology. <laughs> like, this is giving me the zeros and ones to human behavior. And now I, I can take them together, and I can add understanding for how people are behaving personally, professionally, uh, relationally. And that really allows me to help people better understand themselves 
but then also participate in things where we can help people live healthier lives. Because I mean, at the end of the day, my true passion is health and wellness and preventing a lot of the things that we all spend our time talking about. Like, we see this all on the horizon. I always say is, you know, clinicians make the worst athletes because they always wait for something to happen. So could you imagine a goalie that was a clinician? He'd be like, here's a person running downfield. They look like they're going to kick a goal and score. Don't do anything until the ball goes in the net. It's in the net. Now let me run over there. Like, no, stop it. Yeah. Like the health data shows that we have a country heading towards a big problem, but the field of medicine says, well, come back when you meet criteria. Well, we'll treat you when you get here. Absolutely not. Like, let's get ahead of it and let's help people live healthier lives. Your vision and, and your role in that, JT, will it be, obviously, I mean, it'll be a broad sword because you can help many people, but do you, do you have a, a passion to maybe get into these athletes to help them make that transition or maybe even educate them early in their career so that transition later is could be much more smoother or they'll be better prepared is is that part of what you would like to do you think or yeah you know one of the things i want to do is i want to go above the athlete because you got to go to the decision makers you got to go to the people that are creating what the athletes are doing in their day and you got to make them aware and create the influence there so that it trickles down into healthy day-to-day um, education, right? So one of the things I want to do is I want to join the boards. Like there's a health and wellness board in the NFL and the NFL PA. But I was on there the other day and I'm typing and I'm looking, I'm going, yeah, but there's no former players on there. So here you have a whole health and wellness board, but how are they getting insight into what the players would use, what's happening in the players' lives? like? Right. That's a that's a gap there that needs to be filled. And one of the areas that I've found that can be very helpful is continuing to increase my education, continuing to grow as a researcher and to start mastering these disciplines in a way where I can go into spaces and I can say, what are the programs that we're putting in place? Like one of the big things I think about is depression. And, and, and uh, Jose, we're, I'm, I'm teaching our class and I'm talking about depression, right? Because you look at the sports psych literature, uh, Tony, you know this. It only talks about anxiety. Exactly. Why not depression? Right. The depression risk of getting injured, of um, uh, having your career ended, um, not having successful career like you thought you were, right? There's all these factors that are happening in and around of athletes' lives psychologically that I don't think the people at the top are aware enough, are aware of. And I want to go in and be able to take these education and these experiences I've had and to say, hey, let me sit on these decision-making committees to be able to provide information and to be able to say, this is a, an alternative way that we can care for the people that are going to be influenced by these decisions that come from the top. Because one of the things I think about is who's educating coaches. It doesn't matter how much I tell the player, the coach makes all the decision. Right. So in the off season, are the coaches being trained and um, how to help support players' mental health, how to communicate with players. You know, how do you recognize when a player is going through a tough space, a tough place, right? Like say a player's struggling, right? The old school coach adage is grind them harder, yep. grind them harder. But is that psychologically healthy? Or how do we <clears throat> coaches be the first line of recognizing, man, and that's my guy. I spend every day with him. He looks a little yeah. off, but the coach doesn't know what to do. Now we have a problem. So how do we help educate people so that everybody can be healthier? How do we help educate players so they actually know how to maintain their health when the strength coach is gone, when the meal room is gone and the nutritionist isn't there coming to your locker saying, hey, uh, let's talk about what you've been eating. Interesting. Um, when I was, uh, when I, <clears throat> I have twin daughters, they're, uh, uh, one's in grad school, one's graduating college, but I remember when they started playing travel softball. My wife and I, I was the head coach, my wife was general manager. And we put them on a nutrition and supplement and training program that, and I was telling them this, I said, you guys realize you're probably getting trained better than the average college athlete, mainly because we know what we're doing with nutrition and training. So we had that advantage. And what's interesting, all of my peers who also had kids at about the same time, they're like, oh yeah, we put our kids on creates and we make sure they got extra protein. Uh, get omega-3 uh, fatty acids, et cetera, et cetera. So we had 
sort of the advantage of we did the research in it, so we pass it on to our kids. Yeah. Now you have two young, you're a father of two. <laughs> so it's going to be a fun journey. Well, sometimes it's not fun. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> um, when they start playing sports, because I think there's no better way, particularly, and I have two daughters, I think uh, there's no better way to instill discipline and, um, and, and, and sort of a time commitment and, and setting goals than, than sports uh, for, cause for a lot of reasons. And um, are there things you learned you know, from the time you're an athlete, now your post-athletic career that you will have your kids do that there's, it's just something you would have never thought of because you didn't know about it, but it's like, this is what I know. This is what'll be good for you. What would you instill in them when they start, you know, playing whatever, soccer, volleyball, basketball? Uh, The answer to that is everything. I want my children to approach the game like pros from the start. Everything. I'm talking about from recovery. I'm talking about to mm-hmm. the mental state of mind you need to be in, to training, to nutrition, to sleep. When I was a kid, I the last generation above me was the rock star generation. It was party hard and play <laughs> harder. Sleep is for the guys that are corny, nutrition <laughs> irrelevant. What, what does any of that stuff matter? Great athletes show up, lace their shoes and go be great. But I realized a lot of the error in that understanding and that thinking um, so it's funny, you know, I, I laugh at, and I tell my son all the time, dude, never lose your flexibility. And he's like, dad, like do this. I'm like, dad can't do that, man. Dad's too stiff. And he's like, yeah, dad, I'm flexible. I'm flexible. And I'm like, yeah, never lose your flexibility. Sleep, son, you got to sleep. Dad, why do I got to sleep? Because sleep's going to give you big muscles, son. Is it going to give me big muscles? Yeah, but we know sleep's one of the best anabolic things you can do for yourself, Right. Another thing, I you always inspire me when you tell me, I believe that supplementation was going to be a thing of the future, and people tried to shout you down about it. Now, they go, oh, Jose was right. And so for me, I think that space is cognitive training, right? It's the last part of the human body that we have not intentionally tried to influence. And so people go, yeah, but there's not a lot of research out there about it. And I go, yeah, but can you see it bubbling? Yeah. Maybe there's just... 10, 20 studies coming out a month now. But if you think about it, and we understand plasticity is is established, somebody's going to have to harness that. And I want to be on the front end of that space. And that's why I was like, yeah, I'm down to become co-founder of Nestry. It's like, you want me to sit around with a bunch of physicians and neuroscientists and sit around the table and go, okay, well, if this is how the brain works, how could we influence it in a way to be productive for cognitive functioning. So you're telling me that we can be neuropsychologists and we could um, do testing and show that a brain's declining. Well, my thing is anything I can measure, I can improve. And every exercise scientist knows that. I don't care how you show up at your baseline. We're going to give you the exercises and the dose and frequency to help you to be able to improve. I want to do that for the brain. And that's what my kids will do. Like, Like you guys are going to be doing mental performance and cognitive training your whole life. And I think this is going to be neuroprotective. You know, that actually is a great analogy to how sports supplements were treated back in the nineties. It's like, Oh, that's bullshit. There's no science. It's like the science will creep up. And what's (laughs) funny, you mentioned that there is, I read a recent paper. I don't know if I sent it to you where they did uh, they called it brain endurance training. Mm. Um, And I didn't quite understand what the training was for the brain. But it translated into better physical endurance, which mechanistically, I, I can't explain it, but I'm thinking from a pragmatic standpoint, I'm like, okay, this is something that eventually will trickle into, you know, high school, college, maybe the pros, but I think you're on to something. It's, it's just a question of this, and maybe you could help Tony and I. How do you do that? How do you train the brain. I mean, supplements are easy. You give this, figure out the dose, measure the, the, whatever the effect is. But how do you do that? How do you train it? Yeah. So um, it's really interesting what we're doing at Nestry because we've been utilizing neurofeedback, but we took it out of like a clinician's hands, right? So when a clinician does it, they drop things in their clinician model and they say, well, it was X effective. Right. And so there's a lot of uh, research establishing that neurofeedback is effective for things like ADHD and concentration. But then you look at the 
the research studies, you go, you brought a person in once a week? You saw effectiveness in once a week? You're not training. That's not training. If you lifted weights once a week and you said, well, this is how effective weightlifting is, <laughs> people would laugh you out of the, you could you would be laughed out of a performance setting. Yeah. So what we're saying is, if you're trying to find ways to influence the brain, go look at the science, right? There's a lot of different um, techniques that are starting to come out that they're saying, hey, this has been shown to be a little clinically infected, uh, effective or moderately clinically effective. Okay, well, what if you increased the frequency? Exactly. What if you started to train the brain like you train the body, which is every day? What if a person came in and trained every single day? How would you be able to leverage technology to help create positive plasticity? What are the other things that are out there? And if you intentionally start collecting these things and applying them towards a person with a performance mindset, what are the kind of results you're going to get? Well, the answer is that's to be determined. But if Nebraska doesn't bring a weight room in, what do we all look like? like we don't look like me right now. <laughs> but Nebraska said, all right, we'll do it. And then now everyone has to do it. I, I just believe in training. I just so much believe in training. So I believe that the mechanisms are out there. What we've been doing so far has been shown to be very positive and we're looking to continue to build on it, but we're looking to continue to be integrated. So another problem that starts to create um, issues with being as effective as it could be is in clinical settings, they don't integrate anything. But look at what happened to martial arts. Nowadays, every MMA guy has integrated yeah. all martial arts. And now we've got the best fighters we've ever seen in the world. Yeah. Because if you just said, all right, you're, you're just a boxer, go, go compete, but just boxing or you're just a wrestler. Nowadays, you can't be just at anything. You got to bring this combination to what you're doing. And I think that that's the next frontier in brain and cognitive development. And that's what Nestry is all about is let's integrate. I mean, research is gold, but what do most researchers do? They make it, then they sit it on a shelf. They're just waiting for somebody to come pick it up and go, okay, I'll create. <laughs> it's true. That's true. I actually have, uh, we have maybe five minutes left, Tony. I have a fun question for Julius, but you know, if you have any comments, uh, uh, please pipe in. No, go to that. Uh, we'll summarize all this great info after your fun question. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing it. All right. Uh, I know you're a fan of basketball, Julius. And so yep. I like asking this question. It's actually a two part question. Um, who is the greatest, your top three basketball players of all time? So that's one. And this is actually a different question. Who was the most fun to watch top three? Yeah, so I, I try to refrain from talking about basketball players that I never got to see play. And I know some people go, well, yeah, but they're important. But how am I going to tell you who, would think, who I think the best basketball players are if I never got to watch them? Nice. So I grew up number one at the tail end of the Jordan um, career. I think Jordan was done in 98 or... I was, I was pretty young. I think he before finished, that. finished with the Wizards, I think, on 98, right? Yeah. yeah so I, I I was like 10-ish, maybe nine and a half. So uh, for me, I, I think about LeBron, Shaq, and Kobe. LeBron, Shaq, and I mean, what Shaq was doing was so dominant. I mean, we might it might be another 10 years before we see another physical specimen like Shaq. I mean, he was he was human evolution before their time, just the way LeBron is human evolution before his time. Um, but my favorite player of all time is Kobe Bryant. That's why, you know, I keep the Mamba mentality yeah. right here behind me. But what I think what was most fun about Kobe was his mastery of the game. Mm -hmm. He was able to score from any area on the court, but then he was also so committed to the game of basketball. He prided himself on being a great defender. He wanted to lock down the best player on the other team. He wanted to make their fans hate him. And he didn't care at all if he was liked or not. And that was just exciting basketball for me to watch. And, um, you know, he's a great that will always be missed. Yeah, I, I, I concur with that on, on Kobe. And, and MJ was definitely like that. I could say that. Uh, took his, he was, you know, I, I, I think Kobe probably was influenced by Jordan, right? I mean, you would, in a sense, the tenacity on both sides of the ball. And and MJ did have that, but I'm I'm with you on Kobe, man. I'm a big fan of him. He was amazing. Yep. No, it, you know it is funny that um, we we often judge you know sports based on what we watched growing up, 
and I was a huge basketball fan when I was a kid. And I don't know, even if you followed the old New York Knicks and the LA Lakers, um, um, Jerry West, Wilt Chamberlain, uh, Julius Irving, when he played, do you remember the ABA? <laughs> People I mean, I don't remember much of it, but I watched the, uh, like the Lakers documentary. They had a couple that came yeah, out. That was good. So I got yeah. a flavor for those times, but I mean, that, that had to have been exciting. Yeah, it's uh, and and one of the more exciting players I always watched was a guy named Pete Maravich. He, uh, Pistol, he Pete. Was Pistol Pete. Yeah, he was fun to watch. Just he was sort of uh, he was ahead of his time in terms of just sort of the uh, I call it the gymnastics on on the basketball court. Um, so that really is it. Um, you know, I just wanted to get that in because uh, you know people like hearing sort of people's personal opinions on sports. Yep. Tony, do you have any final words? I mean, Julius has been an awesome guest. Yeah, just, you know, my opinion, who's the best tight end ever? It's Julius Thomas. You know, I just <laughs> want to throw that out. <laughs> no, I just got to say, JT, I think this information is so great, so valuable, and I mean that from the heart. Um, you you brought about I, I, something really important just quick. You know, the athlete ride isn't as great as everyone thinks it is. It could be pretty damn tough. And um, they're human beings. They need some help. And, you know, and we need to provide some great resources for them. And I, I'm really happy that you, you're you going to be one of the leaders to do such. So uh, great, great information, great podcast and talking and discussion. So we appreciate it. Yeah. And Julius, tell tell everyone where they can find you or follow you in your work. Um, yep. is, are you on LinkedIn primarily? What social media site can people follow you on? Yeah, you can fo follow me on Instagram, just Julius underscore Thomas. Uh, Part of my evolution, I'll, as classes are slowing down, I'm going to be putting out more and more content, cool. some motivational stuff, some things that are going to help with sports and performance type psychology. Um, and then uh, anytime I have like a podcast or do anything like that, but then I'm also on LinkedIn, just Julius Thomas as well. Um, I'm a little bit more present on LinkedIn. So sometimes I'm able to get back to people, but I just want to thank you guys for having me. You know, it's just been an incredible influence you guys have had on me. And helping me to understand the space, helping me to continue to grow and develop academically and as a researcher. And, you know, the things you guys teach me, I'm going to be telling people for the next 30, 40 years. So uh, I really appreciate the influence you guys have had on my life tremendously. Yeah, yeah thank Thanks, you. And, and if you ever need help from either one of us, I know I speak for Tony, do not hesitate to ask. We're always happy to help. You guys know you're you guys know I I come to you whenever I have a question. You know, Jose, I text you all the time. And Tony, I text you, I'll be like, man, I was wondering about this. You got anything for me here? So you guys have always been a great resource for me just because of the acumen you have. Just I mean, the decades that you guys have spent in these spaces. And I can't wait to say, you know, man, back in oh, man, 2023, <laughs> oh, I was looking at this research and it became important. But then you guys also um, helped me understand the importance of mentoring. And I, I hope to be able to have the influence on people behind me that you guys have had on me. You will, my man. I see it already, no doubt. Well, thanks you again. Uh, you know, Julius, we appreciate your time and uh, we'll have to catch up again. <laughs>